Welcome to the Election Day class. Um, no, we're not going to talk about elections. Um, but we we're talking, Josh and I were talking then, since there is no homework solutions this week, um, our goal is actually to hopefully, given, given what's going on today, hopefully a bit of an early release so if we can manage to do that. So what we're going to do in the first half, I'm going to talk about payments, and mobile payments, so on and so forth. And then, and the second half, we'll take a break. And the second half, Josh from Redmond is going to talk about, not blockchains, the part of it. I'll do a little intro to Bitcoins a little bit, and then Josh is going to go into details of how blockchains work and the good amount of history and the crypto details. All right, so that's kind of the plan. All right, with that, um, Talk about payments, payments is about money, like money goes from A to B or C to D and all sorts of things. And one of my, one of my favorite authors is Niall Ferguson, and he's actually a historian, a Scottish historian, he actually wrote many books, and uh, he talks about money. And one of his presentations, I think it was a TED talk, um, th these numbers actually came from there, it says, so far in the history, as far as we, we can tell, that many people Homo sapiens actually live. Most of them are dead. Um, Sad. And what? Sad. Mm -hmm. Well, they are. <laughs> and if you look at the wealth, as far as <coughs> historians can determine, most of them are actually accumulated fairly recent history. Wealth as in money, so on and so forth. And then historians, I'm, going to talk, I'm not going to talk about history, but this is a little bit of importance here. There's this concept of the great you know, divergence of wealth, like a very small percentage, a lot of wealth, and a big percentage doesn't. And there's actually a lot of theories around it. Um, apparently it peaked around the 70s, um, U.S. having the biggest one. And um, the, the few historians I've looked at, why is it so? And um, apparently... This person, uh, Ibrahim Mutafiriq, who happens to be Ottoman, um, back in that day said, hey, this is probably why. And it seems to be true. And there's some examples that actually Naya gave, actually. He gave several, and I, I took actually a couple of them here. Is it from geography or national or something like that? Travis is actually a car. Um, I didn't know that apparently it was actually built in eastern Germany. According to some claim, it was the worst car ever manufactured compared to Mercedes Benz, yeah, which is a pretty good car. So it's not geography, it's not the nation, it's not the language, it's, it's got to be something else. And North Korea and South Korea is another example of this, so it's got to be something else. So it looks like this Ibrahim's actually um, deduction seems to hold true. And we're going to look at some of that, how that money actually transfers from, from one place to other. And the importance comes with the security entanglements of those, all those transfers, payments, so on and so forth. If you want to know more about it, actually, that's a, that's a good, um, good wealth of nations. Uh, some date may be significant for today. Um, so that's, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good write up if you want to go look at the historical side of it, the money, wealth side of it. So I'm going to dive in directly into essentially EMV. Fairly specific, but has actually, uh, it's gaining more and more significance. Um, EMV, European MasterCard Visa, that's what EMV stands for. Um, it's actually not that old, if you think about it. Credit cards are older than EMV. Um, I'm going to talk about why EMV is talking. But EMV Co., if you want to know more about it, actually most, if not all of their publications are actually public. You can download them in PDF form. Um, and it's a little bit of, the numbers over here, these are uh, circa 2013. Recent numbers, I found some discrepancies, so I, I chose to actually put this one a few years old, but still, it's a good indication. Uh, one, thing, uh, one thing I will highlight, that day is actually predates mobile payments. We're gonna talk about mobile payments. It's a little bit of importance there. So, no, you, hopefully someone, most of you have credit cards, the chip cards, they all have most of them have chips. We'll talk about how they work. What's on a chip? What happens when you insert it? Or what happens if you swipe it? We'll talk about its cryptography, we'll talk about security. 
Um, mobile application, photo, Android Pay, Apple Pay, Microsoft Wallet, it's mobile application. We'll talk about how they work as well. Wearables, well, watch type of things, they're kind of sort of there, we're kind of trying to get there, but not really there. Uh, although I mean, some other personal device, and um, you can imagine all sorts of other devices actually. I'm not gonna say IoT, such an ill-defined term. Um, so one thing about this chip, which is new to the US, but old to the rest of the world, um, it is actually both storage and processing. There is actually a CPU on that chip, and that chip, the interface contacts the way electrical way actually talks to wherever you insert it is exactly the same as smart cards. You know what a smart card is? Uh, uh, every Microsoft employee has one. It's like this little chip over here. If you look at your credit card, it's exactly the same form factor. A regular card. Uh, we'll look at how they work as well. Uh, from a crypto perspective. So why, why do we need EMV anyways? Um, some, of, some, some of the more details. The main, there are essentially two goals. Reduce fraud for, for credit card payments, including debit. When I say credit, I assume that it's both credit and debit. Although if you look at the financial institutions, for bizarre reasons, the actual processing happens on entirely different rails, inefficiency. Well, that's, that's a different topic. Um, unfortunately. And so reduce fraud and also the counterfeiting and it's lost and stolen cards and copying of those cards. That's essentially the main reason why EMV actually was stood up. Succeeded, not succeeded, it's not really a clear cut answer. We'll look at that. So there are a few things actually when we look at those cards. Authenticating, well, authenticating what? What are we authenticating? Am I gonna enter a password? Actually there's a pin. Not in the States, <laughs> kind of behind still, unfortunately, sadly. Um, and that's one that we call the user authentication. There is a specific term I want to talk about. There is a term card holder, CH, it's actually abbreviated. Card holder is an important term. If you have a credit card, you are a card holder. Okay, you own that thing. Um, so you authenticate in the card itself, the physical device in this case with or without a chip card the authenticated card holder and the authenticated device usually the point of sale terminal or whatever you insert your card into in terms of a chip these are all different types of authentications and we'll look at those as well and let's start max drives that little you know dark black strip on the back of your card still used when you swipe that's the only thing that's red. There are uh, those tracks, uh, remember tapes, real tapes and whatnot, multi track but that, those tracks I should come from because it's a max track. On those, there are, in theory, there are three tracks. Third one is not used. Nobody cares, nobody reads, nobody bothers to write anything onto it. So first two are the important ones. Uh, I put actually what's really on those tracks. And most of the data, if you look at track one and track two, they're actually duplicated. For, for some good reason. Second one, ABA, American Banker Association, actually came up with this. Um, in real life, um, both of them are actually used. So uh, I'll decipher those. PAN, <laughs> it's not Peter Pan. It's primary account number. It's that if you have a Visa or MasterCard, most of them at least, that's 16 digit number, it's called a PAN, primary account number. Amex, it's a little bit different. JCB, I don't remember how many digits are on the JCB. JCB is the Japanese. Japanese card bureau or something like that, if I remember correctly. Um, so let's store them both tracks. Yes, in clear text. There's no encryption, there's nothing to encrypt. Name, that's your name, full name. And then the expiration date, also the embossed on the face of the card. Service code, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit, not really that important for this person. And the other, all these acronyms, PVV, personal verification value, CVV, card verification value, sometimes you talk about CVMs, card verification method. Okay. Essentially, that's that three digit number on the back of your card. When you purchase something online, most merchants ask for it because if they provide it, they get actually a better rate from the uh, lower rate from the card networks. That's why they ask for it because risk is lowered. 
Um, that's kind of st what's stored. LRC, think of it as a very poor form of CRC. It's paired to check. There's no crypto there, so you just odd pair to even pair to I don't know which one, it's a pair to check. That's all there is to it. Now, remember previously we talked about this pan. Let's say it's you know 16. I'm not gonna divide it into 16, 16 decimal digits. One of them, well, depends who the issuer is. One of those decimal digits, let's take, let's say it's the last one. This is actually a checksum digit. There is an algorithm, it's called Loons. Checksum algorithm. And it actually computes a fairly simple way. Uh, so in a sense, you have 15 digits on a, most, of the, uh, most of the credit cards. So keep that in mind, we'll, we'll come back to this. Max Stripe, I didn't say anything about crypto. No keys, no algorithms, nothing. So what happens? Well, people copy those stripes. It's not that hard. I, I actually, I looked it up on, the, on, I searched and the first thing that came up there, you can probably buy it a lot cheaper than this. This actually reads and writes. If you only need a reader, it's about mm, 20 bucks or something. You can read Max Stripe. This is reads and writes, so this is a perfect copy device. If you have somebody's card, you can create a new card to clone it, because there's no crypto. For those merchants who accept Max Stripes, you can purchase stuff on it. Um, now there have been many, many cases where the you know, ATM facades, where you insert, and it's actually, there's an attacker's reader. Uh, this is the old style, actually, facade. New styles, actually, I don't even bother putting a full metal plate or on it. What they do, on the, on the little um, a slot, they insert your credit card. There's a very little device attached to the slot. As you slide your card in, it also reads your device. Actually, you can find them on the internet. Some of them actually are very proud because they have devices that connect the GPS network that actually automatically upload. So they actually, people actually are very proud of, hey, this, our skimmer is better than yours type of thing. That way you don't need to go it's back to, to the collection. Yeah, you don't need to go there. If somebody actually finds it, dismantles it, yeah, go buy another one. So max stripes are bad, <laughs> as if we didn't know. So let's go back to EMV. A little bit of history. Yeah, cards are old. So even if you know the card number, you can create the stripe, right? Because they are yeah. so they, all the data. With, with, if, you, if you know, easy. if you know all this data, yes, you can. Yeah. Yes, you can. The way they are encoded, there's a certain way of encoding it. It's all public. Yeah, there's nothing secret. I mean, yeah, you can create it. Absolutely. But <laughs> if somebody is inserting their card into your reader, why bother stealing it? Somebody's giving it to you. So. It's a little bit of a sad situation. Um, so a little bit of history to, to, to give you a little bit of perspective, hopefully. The real plastic isn't that you know, new. Um, the Max Stripe advancement came in right in the 70s. So till about last year in the US, we've been using 40 plus year old technology for our money. So it's sad. Uh, the, the, in Europe actually started, the French actually was the first time, was deployed, what was deployed, the chip cards were deployed. Uh, no wonder actually there's a good amount of smart card research and developments in France, that's still the case, although it's not the only one. You know. And now later on, uh, the EMV and the EMV Co, EM, the separation is the EMV Co became an LLC, that's kind of what the separation is. But 96, this is the first time they actually published something or ratified something. Um, <laughs> as, that's, 2007 is actually fairly recent, L1. I'll say something about this L1 because there is a certification program. If you want to have a card, either a physical card, or if you want to use, if you want to enable uh, contactless payments on your mobile device, like those little devices on your, in your pocket, like this guy, uh, you have to go get an L1 certification. Okay, there is actually company or depending on which network you work with, you get your certification. It's about contactless protocol. Nothing about crypto. We're not even talking about crypto. And then 2008, finally the contactless protocol. It did not say much about NFC. That's what we use today. All those three examples. Did not say about NFC, but NFC is obviously one communication method. If we recall, there is a um, 
Um, Visa has actually the, what's it, PayWave, and MasterCard has the PayPass. They're also contactless. They did not use NFC. It wasn't really active. Okay, it was a passive contactless protocol. But nowadays it's actually active. We'll see what happens there. I'll talk about tokenization. If you go into any kind of payments, um, you'll hear the term PCI, payment card industry, and they are really big on tokenization. When I heard this a number of years ago, I said, what is tokenization? Um, they really, they couldn't feel, uh, the, the first people I asked, they work on in PCI, I couldn't get a real clear description of it. Now that I work on it, I'll tell you what it is. I'll find out what it is. Some st statistics. Do you see us, US? Yes. I don't, because we're almost non-existent. <laughs> we're the one on the right-hand side that's almost flat, it's less than 1%. Granted, this is about two years old, two and a half years old. We're actually more than that. I know we're more than that, but I didn't want to put it because I don't have the exact number. That's why I put it there. Um, is Europe, the Europe is leading the pack. There's a question? Yeah, what is the reason for that? The reason for that, <laughs> because we didn't really have cheap cars here in the States. The mandate, sort of a mandate, I'll talk about liability shift. Um, that, uh, on the next slide, actually, it's timely. Um, if I remember right, it was last year, April 2015 or October 2015, if I remember correctly. Uh, the credit card networks, EMV now contains, I believe, seven members. They come up and say, well, if you don't have chip, and if you don't accept to the merchants, actually, if you don't have a chip reader, if you accept a payment without a chip, um, now the liability shifts to you. What do I mean by liability? If somebody, you as the cardholder, disputes to charge and win, who pays for it? Currently, banks, issuers pay for it. They take the risk. Some bank issues your card. If you flip on the back, there's an issuer. Some bank, actually, some financial institution stands behind those, those funds. Um, the thing is, merchants, well, you're taking the risk if you keep accepting payments using only max threat. That's liable to shift. It's important for technology firms like us, or if you work in a technology company, it's kind of important to keep that liability on the issuer side, not pass it on to the merchant. There are challenges with that. So that's, that's kind of why uh, we didn't have that, because liability shift wasn't there, and the fraud rate in the States, I guess it wasn't that high of a big deal that people really didn't care, people as merchants and the network card issuers. And if you travel overseas, a um, few years ago, I don't remember when, it depends on the country, uh, we couldn't really use our swipe cards in Europe, especially in Europe. And that was a big pain in the backside. Um, and now they work most of the time. <laughs> so that, 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 there's actually more, more reasons than that. So um, kind of look at those track one and track two on the max drives. Now the EMV, there's both storage and processing, crypto processing, and there's a pin. What is that pin? What's that do? No, we don't have it, but the only pin we have in most cases is when you try to get money at an ATM. Well, the way that pin is used in cryptographic algorithms and the protocols is actually extremely underspecified. If you go look at EMV specifications, you're not going to find how PIN is merged, merged into cryptography. It's as well as issuer dependent, card network dependent. When I say card network, think of Visa and MasterCard and Amex and JCB and folks like that. Okay. And if you're, if you're about to implement any one of these, you're actually going to have to get those specifications from the card network. Question? Right, yeah, but if somebody, if you go buy a, a scanner, plug it into your point of sale system. Mm. I mean, you can buy these off the shelf, and yeah. I guess maybe the new readers, are you saying that it's not an open specification anymore, or are you saying it just gets sent plain text up to MasterCard and they decide what to do with it? Not specified. Depends which card network you're talking to, depends which terminal you're talking to, depends what kind of card you have. Even from the same network, even from the same issuer bank, You'll have two, 
Today, we have two different cars that behave exactly, uh, uh, entirely differently. Some pins are validated on the card on the chip. They never leave the chip. So if we enter them, actually, we'll, we'll look at the, one of those protocols okay. in a moment. Thank okay. you. That's unfortunately not very well defined. Uh, the ones I look, I'm familiar with a few of them, because uh, I worked on them. I think we could have done better. Let me put it that way. Um, so kind of talk about the light voltage shift a little bit. So, so far, slowly we're easing into cryptography here. There's a term called cryptogram. EMV actually defines this term, cryptogram. What is a cryptogram? It's the result of some crypto operation. What kind of crypto? What, 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 what do we use it for? A few TLAs, or some of them actually have four letters. TLA, three-letter acronym. Uh -huh, there's a TLA for TLA. Um, so when we go look at the protocols of what the, who the actors are in payments, We'll see terms like this uh, ARQC, ARPC. Think of it this way. Let's say I use, this happens to be an Apple phone. I use Apple Pay, right? If I tap this on a point of sale terminal, my phone generates that ARQC. It's essentially a Mac. Or it could be encryption, or it could be both, or it can even contain a signature algorithm. We'll look at what they could be and how they're done. That's sent all the way back to the issuer. That's what ARQ is. So what comes back is that uh, the ARPC all the way down at the bottom. This guy. This is the response. But it may not come back. Depends how the issuer implemented the protocol. Okay. You may never hear. So when you pay with your, even with your chip card or your phone, your phone may or may not hear anything back. In fact, I don't know of a POS terminal if you use the mobile phone that actually sends you a result back if it succeeded or not succeeded. On your mobile device, you'll see transaction complete. Doesn't matter who manufactured the device. You, it has the same behavior. That's a little bit sad. There are reasons for that. Mostly NFC specific. Um, cryptogram, you would think there is one crypt. There isn't one cryptogram. There are multiple cryptograms. And the way they define, there, is, uh, there are recommendations which I'll explain, crypto details, but all networks I'm aware of have their own flavor of data that actually goes into that. We'll look at some of those as well. So that, this, is, this is where we are. Um, there's actually, EMV is also changing, has been changing over the years. Um, both in terms of crypto, in terms of protocol. There's a new, actually, next generational chip specifications they are working on as part of what's actually relevant for us. Uh, l 2 curve cryptography currently is not used. Uh, it's actually worse than that, we'll get to it. Um, they're working on that ETC. I looked at the specification, I have some feedback. We'll see when it becomes a reality. But I am, unfortunately, not very optimistic. We're pushing it, but we'll see where it goes. That value add data, it's all about risk. It's all about issuers, mostly card networks, credit card networks, trying to assess the risk right there as you're making the transaction. Because most transactions are online nowadays. You, know, you don't batch a pile of papers and later on go to the bank and try to cash them. That still happens, but all online transactions, they, they actually really go hit the issuer online over the internet. Um, and your card has several bits, <laughs> at, if, if you're lucky, bytes of, um, of a risk data. That actually, they are determined at manufacturing time. The terminal your card talks to, it also has risk data. All of them are sent all the way back to the banks. A risk is assessed. And then your transaction is approved or not, not approved. Yes? So you said that the even online transactions implement, but with online transactions, there's no chip interaction, right? There is, actually. We'll, we'll look at that. Okay. There is, yeah. So actors, because we're going to look at some of the protocols. We know who, who's playing here. This is you, cardholder. 
you own a debit card, credit card, something along those lines. We're, from now on, we're going to talk about chips because Mac stuff isn't very interesting for us. Okay. And then there is the merchant that you're buying something. I'm buying, I don't know what I'm buying. I'm buying lunch. Okay. Some restaurant. That's, that's a merchant. Then this guy is called acquirer. Sometimes you may hear the term processor. Merchants actually go have some sort of business agreement with an acquirer. First Data Corporation, there's actually hundreds of them over there. Um, that's what, how they're, they're connected to, usually over the internet. There's this POS device, uh, you configure it, it talks to your, you know, whoever you have a business agreement with. And starting with the merchant, acquirer, token service provider, which is also called TSP, payment network, think about your credit card network, Issuer, think, think of it as a bank or a big financial institution. All of them are regulated. And there's a little bit of regulation on the, uh, on the merchant side as well. Regulated as in, uh, there is both federal and payment card industry PCI regulations that you have to do. Payment network is like Visa or MasterCard? Yeah, exactly. And all of those banks and card networks, they all have internet accessible entry points, which are you know, white IP whitelisted and ACLED and mutual TLS, sometimes actually VPN. Depends what kind of network you're talking about. Can you but they all TSP? go over the internet. Question? Can you, explain, can you explain the TSP again? Oh, What's TSP, a token service provider. So, uh, now let me actually, this is a good place to define what it is. Do you remember we talked about a few classes two or three ago, random oracle, or a pseudo-random function? Remember how I defined it? I give you a value. You're a random oracle. I give you a value. You actually give me a random number back. Okay. The only way I can get, the, I can get that the value I gave to you, I have to provide the same random number back to you. If you give me a different value, you're going to give me an entirely different random number. By observing, by just looking at these random numbers that you give me, I can't determine what the values are. Okay. That random number output, it's a token. <laughs> so, so let's actually reduce it to practice. Think about your 16-digit PAN card number. You turn to your tokenization service. You say, here's my PAN. Here's my credit card number. It gives you a token. Is that like a hash function or a hash value? Hash is not a token because 16 digits are long enough, you can exhaustively search and find it. Remember our SSN question? Yeah. Same problem. But so um, I thought you said that the random oracle is going to give you back the same um, result, yes. the same input. Yes. But in this case, in the pen space, same thing applies to CVV three-digit number. Your domain isn't that big. So you, you fall flat on the security side. You know, it doesn't really work. Exhaustive search actually figures out the input value. So those HSLs, you right? You can implement a tokenization service based on HSM. Uh, you got to be careful about PCI, payment card industry compliance. The moment you deal with PAN, the moment you deal with CVV, you have to be PCI compliant, otherwise you're in big trouble. Is it is the token like the reference ID or it, or is that more of the acquirer's level of operation? Um, multiple multiple players here can actually stand up a tokenization service. I see. There are in fact the reason I split this out, uh, there are actually companies out there they say we give you, we, we can actually set a tokenization service for you, for financial institutions. More and more, you'll see um, acquirers and processors are actually sort of value add functions because tokenization has become really important. Well, I'm going to talk about tokenization when we talk about mobile protocol. That's why I'm kind of trying to ratchet this up to get there. Thank you. So that's, tokenization is really interesting. To hash, oh, I can use hash. Don't forget that. Get back to that. 
you can't use hash. So um, <laughs> to go look at EMV, there are four four books, PDF files, the colon books. Book two is important for our class because that's where you see security and key management requirements. That's where the algorithms are defined. We're gonna peel that on you in a minute. So um, now we're talking about this user card holder, terminal, and physical card authentication. But there are a few ways of doing it. First one is static data. It's actually a few more. There is also dynamic data authentication. There is then also combined. It's on the next picture. Combined DDA. Now you may think when you hear the term dynamic, oh, it's got to be a protocol. Uh, uh, it's not that sophisticated. It's it's kind of sad actually. Um, static data. It's actually you can store it in the max stripes. There's some uh, discretionary data section in the, in the track one or track two. I forgot which one. Actually, some I think some card networks store the static data there. What is static? It doesn't change. Protocol is essentially read the static data and verify, which you can clone. It doesn't stop from anything cloning. There is nothing exchanged between your card, your chip, and the terminal you use your card into. It's on your card. Terminal reads it, verifies it. Says, ah, signature verifies. It must be a good card. It's kind of pathetic. Um, what's in it? Static data. Um, so, on that, okay, on that chip, I don't have to show it to you. That chip is actually uh, there's a CPU. It runs a, a constrained version of a Java execution environment. It's called Java Card. Remember Java Card? That's what it runs. It's a JCOP type of thing. And then you have applications written in Java that run on that on that chip. And those applications, there are a few companies that actually write those applications. And those chips actually go through a lot of certification, including common criteria and FIP certification at EL4 plus levels, because financial institutions actually mandate it. And when that application runs, that Java runs on it, it has an application identifier. And it actually, um, that, 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 that the app is signed. That's what's actually verified on the static. Let's get the other two. They're very similar to dynamic cases. Um, there's actually one dynamic thing. That's what's called the unpredictable number. It's a random number. Um, it's actually 32 bits long. It's not very long. Um, in, in one, we'll come back to this. Um, the terminal generates that random number, sends it to your card, to your chip. Your chip actually collects a bunch of data. We'll look at what it is, including a bunch of numbers that actually come from the terminal, including this super long 32 bit random number, and then signs it and sends it back to the terminal. Terminal verifies it with a public key. Remember the certificate chains? There is actually a certificate chain on those terminals. If it verifies, it says, ah, card is authentic. That's how card is authenticated to the POS terminal. So the dynamic thing is 32 bits of random number. Yes? So in which direction is the certificate chain? Uh, there's, a, there's a certificate on the card? Yeah, I have a picture. I'll show you in a minute. Um, the, 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 the difference here is, um, I'll, I'll highlight in the picture too, uh, in this case, in the, if we look at the, these, these two cases, uh, dynamic and combined dynamic, okay, each card has a unique signature key pair. In the static, cards don't have signature key pairs because there is nothing for them to sign. They just present, here's a bucket of bets. Okay, we'll look at the key hierarchy in a minute. Okay, and actually slide after this. So now we have three ways of good or bad authenticating the actual physical chip on, on, on this device if somebody didn't clone it. Um, 
What do we do with the pin, right? We're talking about pin. So this is one protocol in the offline verification case. Um, you actually, there, the, 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 there's a, in addition to the signature key pair, there's another key pair, public-private key pair, and that's only there to encrypt the pen. So there's a little bit of a protocol here. It's essentially um, your chip generates a random number, 64 bits long in this case, sends it over to the terminal. Terminal generates another random number, concatenates somehow and pads it, and then encrypts that with the card's public key, sends it back, card decrypts, verifies if that's true, then it's talking to your right terminal. Where is the pin? Ah, you enter the pin on the terminal, not on the device. This is one protocol, one pin verification protocol. You enter your pin on the terminal because your card doesn't have buttons on it, right? You insert your card, terminal, you enter your pin, terminal encrypts your pin using your card public key, sends it along with these two random numbers, your card verifies it, because your card knows your PIN somehow, there is no standard remembered up to the implementer, checks, ah, oh, this is the correct PIN, maybe they use hash functions, I know what they use, and then says, oh, okay, transaction is okay, and actually less the, crypto, uh, the, less the crypto can be generated on the car send terminal. This is one way of authenticating PIN. Uh, this is actually a good one. Is that actually Not used in... Uh... This one? Yeah, yes, it is. Offline, offline verification? Yes. Exists? Yes, it does. Well, Mostly, if you, if you go to a merchant with an old style terminal, they are called like version 202, uh, 30, 31, there's some versions. Older the version, you know, online capabilities are severely limited. And those terminals, uh, we're going to talk about the, actually, let's go to the next one. Uh, it's a key hierarchy. Let's talk about public keys. Only key pairs. We haven't talked about symmetric keys yet. This is the bank. Could be a card network, but let's assume it's the bank. Okay. Bank generates all the keys. Bank knows all the keys. They can drive all the keys because they own the funds. And no discussion. There is a CA. Somebody can operate, usually in the HSM, their private key. Okay, they got the, 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 the goal of the CA certificate authority is to issue these public key certificates. And no, they are not X509 certificates. They are actually, they have their own standard encoded in bits and bytes in a very 70s archaic fashion. And then the issuer then manufactures your card. You know what ICC is? Integrated circuit card. That's the chip. If you see ICC in these payment protocols, that's the chip. Um, there are a few different TLAs that you'll run across. This is one of them. So on this card, remember SDA static application data? Well, the issuer signs that application, remember the Java app, signs it along with the signature, it just stamps it on the storage part of your chip. And there is your app, there is your payment app running on the chip. This is static. Now in the dynamic case, so this is kind of a two level public key hierarchy, okay. And the terminal here has actually several, I believe up to six with some expansion um, provisions, uh, CAs. They, they actually store the public keys on the terminals. On all merchants' terminals, they have public keys stored in them, CA public keys. That's how they verify uh, your card certificate. In the dynamic case, on the card, I'm going to put it here, there is actually another key pair. This is called ICC key pair. We'll look at what it is. It's also generated, depends, either on the card, on the chip, or generate an HSM and then inject it into the chip on the factory floor, depends who your manufacturer is. And then there is a certificate issued for that card, either by the bank issued or by the CA, depends. And that's how your card certificate is verified by the terminal. Terminal verifies all these things. 
that's kind of how the static and dynamic keys are used. Okay. Now, recall cryptogram. I didn't talk about what, what, what do we do with this. So think of chip only. Your card application runs on this chip card that's some Java applet, effectively. Talks to the terminal. Or your mobile Sorry. device over NFC talking to your POS terminal, point of sale terminal. Same thing. This is the data input, unprotected data input. We're going to protect it in a minute. Um, some parts actually come from the terminal. When it says terminal, that's the point of sale terminal. And when it says ICC, well, that's your chip. Right? They are actually contributed. And then a MAC is generated over this message authentication code. We'll see how that's generated. In some cases, depending on the protocol negotiation, the capabilities of your card, this thing is also encrypted. We'll see how. Now, take a look at this. A few things I want to highlight here. Um, this guy, that's the only random number here. 32 bits, exactly. No more, no less. This guy is two bytes, uh, ISO something something standard. That's the date of the transaction, whenever you're doing. I believe it's always Zulu time, GMT time, GMT. And this guy has actually, important, it's called ATC, Application Transaction Counter. Now, if we work on distributed systems, you're going to cringe a little because there is a counter on your card stored in the chip. It's updated by one per transaction. That counter has to be kept in sync with the issuer. Okay. They may get out of sync, and issuers define how they deal with it. Okay? Same thing for contactless. There's also a counter per, per, per card. And what if you have a credit card with a pen? What if you have another one for your spouse? It's exactly the same pen. How do you distinguish between the two? There's actually another thing called, I forgot the TLA, effectively a, um, what well, amounts to a serial number. Your card is probably one, the other is probably two. When keys are determined, those serial numbers are taken into account. I'm saying determined, I'm not maliciously or fishiously being vague because how keys are derived also depends on the network and the issuer. We're going to look at some of the standards about that. But this is not all. <laughs> Depending on the card network, there are optional, additional, what's called risk data. There may be one, zero, or more of them added to it. Your card usually contributes. In some cases, terminal contributes. And your device, your chip, has to sign them as well, Okay, without knowing what they really are. What is it used for the, when it's decrypted at the other end? The, which like one? Does, I mean, can you tell uh, like the risk data? What's what's an example of what that would be, and, and, yeah. and, and how the issuer would 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 make a determination? Yeah. So um, there are actually these are in a bizarre way encoded in bits in some cases. Uh, think of them as some. You, for instance, if you're using your phone, okay. You probably have location. Location is a risk data. If you have a device, a phone, that phone has a unique identifier. That's a risk data, part of risk data. If, if that's a chip, chip doesn't know its location. Um, but when those applications are stamped onto those, uh, Java applets are actually stamped onto those uh, chips, um, there are capability bits, for instance, some of them are like this. These keys cannot be used without a pin. That's a configuration setting. That's not a risk data. So the issuer can say, oh, I'm talking to a card that will not approve a transaction without a pin, or that will not process with a max stripe. Recently, in the last year, if you received a chip card, 
if you go to, I don't remember which merchant, it may have been Target, with a chip, if you accidentally swiped it, the terminal probably rejected your transaction. It probably beeped a very irritating noise. That's what it is. That's a good thing. Okay. Some of them may be checked right there on the terminal. Some of them actually go travel all the way back to the issuer. There are many others, and depending on the network. Right. Um, just a few. We'll find lots more attacks. But now we're talking about the unpredictable number. Well, the, actually, someone did a little bit of research on these POS terminals. Uh, a manufacturer, I'm not going to give names here, you can find them, uh, actually implemented a random number generator. It returned one, two, three, four, oh, five, wow. six, so on and so forth. So it's kind of trivial to determine what the next random number is. I hope it's fixed, and I hope those merchants who happen to manufacture them update it. Probably not. Um, so replay attack is kind of trivial to pull off. Um, the paper clip is a bizarre one. So actually happened with two different manufacturers. One of them is you'll find them at store here. There is this, uh, you, you actually insert your, it's a chip reader. You insert your card. You remember when you type your pin, right? There's a pin. Here's the debit card, for instance. Well. Um, they, they, they actually left some uh, like a pinholes uh, because they also cover the uh, the keypad so that others can see, can snoop on and do a shoulder surfing. They actually covered it so it's not hard to see. So attack actually pushed paper clip through those pins and hid the paper clip behind those covers. And when you push the paper clip through those pinholes, it actually contacts with the motherboard. And you can actually snoop on the keypad and read the pin. It's called a paper clip attack. <laughs> Some of them require a bit more, you need to actually drill a hole and things like that, but still you could do that. It has nothing to do with cryptography, just pin stealing. Remember keyloggers? That's kind of a keylogger here. Um, Compromise card readers. Um, I, if I remember, if they actually traced the source to a specific country, that was actually a big country um, funded attack. They actually collected pens and pins because the, the, the terminal was actually compromised. Um, you may recall things like the Target's unfortunate case or the Home Depot case or the and this goes on and on and on and on. In many cases, actually, software was compromised. So it happens, even with chips. It's better, still happens. I want to get rid of CVVs. I'm on a soapbox, OK? <laughs> I'm on a soapbox. The sole purpose of the CVV is actually a poor standard for what's called a card present transaction. You're in a store. Physically, you're there. You plot your physical plastic. Give it to the guy behind the, behind the counter, and it does whatever it does, and it's called card present. I'm here, here's my card, there is my name. If he is curious, most people are not, you can actually check my ID, because I write check ID on the back of my card instead of signing it. Um, and that's called a card present transaction. I am in possession of my physical card. What do you do in online transactions? You can't do card present. That concept doesn't, but well, that's what CVV is for. That three digit super duper secret is a substitute for a card present. Now, who doesn't have an email here? Right, don't answer that. Um, we are all authenticate ourselves to something. That something usually is password or a two-factor app or some rotating number, whatever that is. I submit that secret is better than a three-digit number. Why don't we use it? Off the softbox. All right. So the CVV, it's, it's also on the magnetic stripe, right? If they, if they uh, clone the yeah. data, they yes. also have the CVV. Imagine putting your password on a max stripe and you swipe it. That seems very backwards. Yeah. But that's why we have. 
Um, let's talk about some crypto now. All right. Um, I'm going to talk about Mac and uh, about encryption. Uh, here, here's the guts of the algorithms. I'm, I'm leaving that gap. Oh, here's the pen. Here's the CVV. Here's the cryptogram, the unpredictable number, all of that. And how they are actually packaged and fed into these crypto algorithms, there's actually a lot of leeway for issuers and card networks and how they would go about using them. Okay. But let's go down to all the way down to crypto now. All right. As far as encryption, um, this is symmetric encryption algorithms. There are only two modes defined, ECB and CBC, whether it's in codebook and cipher blockchain. And there's padding. Remember padding? This is block cipher. Uh, stream ciphers are not used. Only block ciphers are. Um, so this is how you pad. You put out, this is hexadecimal. Eight zero, you know, one followed by seven zeros. And then you add as many zeros so that the padded length is an integral multiple of your block cipher's block length. Okay? If it aligns, well, you add another block. Just like that PKSS seven padding we looked at, one or two, two, three, three, three. It's a little bit different, padded with zeros. Then what do you do? Okay, if it's ECB, well, you just encrypt. Well, that's ECB, not much to do. You encrypt each one of them independently. If it's CBC, you encrypt with a zero IV. There is no randomness. So if you encrypt the same thing, you're going to have the same ciphertext. Okay? There are some provisions for that, but that's kind of where we are. Algorithms. What algorithms are defined and what algorithms are used? Now, if you go look at EMV book number two, it's actually defined in the appendix, appendix A dot something. It says triple dash. Now, initially, when I talk to banks and card networks, it's always about triple dash, triple dash, triple dash. So naturally, I assume it's a you know, 192 bit key. No, it's not a 192 bit key. It's a two key triple dash. So if you ever work in the payments, I encourage you to challenge them and say, no, 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 it's not a triple desk key, it's a two desk key. You do E, D, E, but the first and the third key are the same keys. Mm -hmm. Okay, your entropy is about 112 bits. We're gonna look at a, a, a bit more detail there. Now, specification, EMV book also defines a yes for all three key lengths. 128, 119, 256. I haven't seen it implemented. I'm not aware of a terminal. Terminal is not really used that. Or an um, issuer that actually accepts a yes. With one exception that's kind of in the works, but it's not really rolled out yet. Now, when I ask for it, there's a big pushback. Uh, it requires a lot of investment to move from triple days to a yes. So that's kind of where we are on the symmetric encryption side with the payments. And it's the same for online, uh, the, 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 the mobile payments. We use exactly the same algorithms. Now, I'm going to talk about RSA in the next few slides. Let's talk about hash functions. Ah, there's this actually. OK, let's peel the onion first. We'll talk about hash functions in a minute. How do you use this? Triple this with two key, that's what I mean. But in the old days, DES was actually also an approved algorithm. Okay. So there may, I don't think they exist in the US. I'm not aware of one. Uh, elsewhere, there may be chips that may still use DES, but they, those cards probably expired by now. So it's probably safe to assume that DES is not used anymore, but I would not be surprised if there is one somewhere on the planet. So anyways, for all intent and purposes, let's imagine triple does with two keys, never with three keys. And so the way they do Mac is essentially CBC Mac. Remember CBC, you do the chaining and then get the last block, all 64 bits of it, that's your Mac. It's also called C Mac, C for CBC. That's how the Mac is generated. Now there's a bit of, you know, 
the jujutsu move here with the keys. Um, <laughs> the, there's something called a session key because per transaction, which is a session, a new key is derived, never at random, but derived from another key, which is called a master key. On your chip, there's a master key stored on your mobile device as well. Now per transaction, a key is derived from your master key. It's called a session key, and then that key is used to Mac or encrypt. Okay? And that's, you know, we're talking about this triple desk key. These are the same key values. Okay, that's called um, session key left, session key right. That's kind of how they defined it. And you go to D CBC, your straight, uh, regular CBC, and then you say, what is going on here? You thought this was really triple, it is not triple dash. It is not triple dash. So, <laughs> so we talk triple dash with two keys, right? It's good. Oh, okay, it's, it's a weird triple dash. Here's what's going on. This is, this is your input data. Remember the cryptogram stuff, the uh, uh, currency code, the amount, and unpredictable, all that stuff, risk data. There's your input. Into a, this is single dash. 56 bit key. You run it in CBC mode to encrypt all of your data. Single desk. Throw away everything, only get the last block, 64 bits. And then you run it with the second key. It's called a left key. Okay. You only do one encryption, ECB mode. The output is the MAC. This is what's called triple DES in the payments area. Not the triple DES that you think it is. It's pathetic. And this is kind of the details. I actually codified them over here. Um, that's where we are. This is the modern chips. Hopefully, we'll get AES one of these days. Um, this is how the specification is. It's crypto, this part, the Mac generation is reasonable. It's actually what you would expect. Okay, run CBC, get the last block, that's your Mac. Fine, there's nothing wrong with it. Well, how do you, how do you drive that AES key? So it's a bit weird. So run the session key derivation per, per transaction. So you run this algorithm with some constant. You essentially encrypt a constant. 0, 0, 0 at the end is 87 hex. You encrypt it with your key. The output, you encrypt it with AES. Actually, the algorithm is AES. Encrypt the constant with your session key for that session. And then you take the output, which I call L here, and then you actually generate this. Um, so the two keys, okay, K1 and K2. These, this kind of sort of, they're the same keys. They don't really differ. They're just shifted by one. And if the MSB most significant bit happens to be one, well, you XOR the constant again. Um, I don't know of a cryptographer value of doing that, but that's how it's defined, okay. Um, I don't know if we can change it in, in the next version of EMV. I hope so, but this is where we are today. Um, luckily, this is not really used. Let's talk about session key. We talk about the actual uh, algorithms to use the session key. Where does it come from? I remember that master key, key derivation. Key derivation, you may think like HMAC, well, no, there's no HMAC, there's no real KDF, and there's not a modern KDF. Because these things actually predate what we today call a modern KDF. Expansion, extraction, those things do not exist in EMV. So here's how it works. KM is the master key on your chip, store on there, or on your mobile device, same thing. Okay, you run a random number, we'll talk about it in a minute, you essentially run it through a function, and the output is your session key. What is that function? Ah, oh, it's a KDF. Sort of, sort of. Um, 
this is where it gets a bit funky. If if that algorithm, let's say it's it, it can either be two K triple des or AES. Those are your choices. Okay. Let's say it's single des. And you need a session key of six to four bits. Your block length of of your algorithm is six to four bits. So you run it once, it's enough. That's option one. What if you need 128 bits of session key? As in the two key does. Well, then you don't do it that way. You do it the other way, which is you essentially take these two numbers. The only difference is this. You encrypt them independently with your master key, and now you concatenate them. That's your KDF. Okay, this is used today. Bizarre KDF, but that's where we are. Now, where is that? What is that? What is that we encrypt with the master key? I said, oh, or we'll get back. Okay, let's see, let's look at what it is. So it's called a diversification data. It's essentially a nonce. Yes, you go get some random numbers. That's what R stands for. Um, except that the first block, which is the length of your cipher, the algorithm, um, it's actually overwritten by other things. Those things can be, well, they're not really well defined. There are a few suggestions. One of them is, remember that counter that you have to keep in sync between your card and the issuer? <coughs> That ATC, 16 bits of ATC, is, can be the first um, input to it. So it's, that part is not terrible, but the way it's used is very sad. Um, signature. Now, this is, um, this is its own standard. It, your data is actually partial assigned. This, you first hash it, yes. The hash algorithm is actually SHA-1 and nothing else today. Uh, at least it's not MD5. And then you go encrypt. What do you encrypt? Well, you take your <coughs> hash, okay, and you do this funky, oops, funky padding. 6A is hex 6A. BC is... Um, yet another constant. Your hash, the computer over here, and then the first half of your message, and then you encrypt it with your private key. How do you verify? Well, you decrypt. Well, verify essentially encryption with public key, and then you retain the data and then you compare. This is, in, in the signature term, this is all called uh, signature with message recovery. So signature is effectively public key encryption, which amounts to decryption. All right, that's kind of how, how signature is verified. Now, here's, here's the last thing. SHA-1, it's not good, but SHA-1 in this sense, it's actually not bad because the maximum RSA modules you can ever have in EMV is 1984 bits. That's the maximum. You can't have longer than that. I am not sure what the actual deployments are. Okay. Now, let's get some of the protocols. And then after this, I'm, I'm going to switch to mobile payments. Now we'll take a break and switch over to Josh. Um, from those actors, kind of how it works. This is fairly, hopefully, straightforward now. Now, this is either your card or your mobile device. Same thing. If it's mobile device, if it's, I'm sorry, card, you kind of physically insert it. If it's mobile device, well, you tap it. Otherwise, it's the same. And then this uh, request is generated on the card. ARQC includes this triple des cryptogram, the Mac. Okay. And then it is sent to the terminal, to the acquirer, to the card network, and then to the issuer. An issuer verifies the MAC, 
which means issuer knows that circuit key. Issuer knows how to drive your session key because issuer is the one who put the card master key on your card in the first place. Okay, they look it up by your card number. It's verified and then the response, uh, it may even be sent. Uh, it may be actually dropped anywhere on, along the way. Probably it goes all the way to the acquirer and it might stop there, it depends. It's kind of how this is work. So this is the, what's called a card master key. TMK, you may see that. It's a uh, full 112-bit circuit key on your card or on your device. Now let's talk about mobile payments, devices. Windows phone, Apple phone, Android, Samsung, they all do similar thing. Uh, in this case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on, on the Android Pay. I'm sorry, uh, the Apple Pay, but similar things. Now, this few few things first. Uh, it's something called SE. It's overloaded, but SE means a secure element. Secure element means effectively, you remember that chip? Okay. Well, it's kind of ludicrous to add that chip on a mobile device. First, it's too big, and two, two it's like a 30, 40 year old technology. Why would we do that? Well, we don't do that. We actually, when we manufacture our SOC, system on chip, we actually put a secure element in it. It's called an embedded SE, ESE. Most, most uh, manufacturers actually are moving in that direction now, ESE. And it also goes through the common criteria and first form for the certifications at a fairly high level. That's the guy who has the keys, all the cryptography keys. Okay. And now your regular NFC stack and then there's also something called a secure enclave. The secure element doesn't know how to authenticate the card holder. When you type your PIN or iris scan or a fingerprint, that goes into, in most cases, the ARM CPUs or the Intel CPUs, what's called a trust zone or a different CMSC type of devices. It goes into your CPU's secure, secure world and your fingerprint or the pin authentication is done there. And there's actually a physical connection, usually over SPI, serial peripheral interface, that goes from that trust zone to the secure enclave or to your TPM, depending on how it's implemented, and it says, yes, user is authenticated. And then cryptograms are generated in the SE and pushed to the NFC stack. That's kind of how it's done, yes? If it's over SPI, wouldn't it be vulnerable to Probing it on circuit board? If you can probe on it, yes. But usually, well, depends how it's manufactured. If there are two discrete chips, you right. can you can do that. Right. But if they are embedded all in one, that's kind of all in the same SFC. So um, I believe, well, I don't know how it is on this device. On earlier devices, they were actually discrete chips. So yeah, you could do that. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Initialization is kind of interesting um, because I'm not sure if it's how it started. So what you can snoop on the device at the manufacturing floor, again, this varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. Maybe your secure enclave and your secure element um, at manufacturing time, not indirectly, a shared key is actually stamped. How the key is stored depends on your manufacturing process, if you have secure fuses or wherever you store them. Um, so when sensitive data is actually transmitted, such as, yes, this user's authentication is fine, it's actually protected with that shared key. So ah. if you snoop, you may not be able to modify. Thank you. Okay. And replay protection, so on and so forth, as you would expect. They should be there. Okay, that's one area. Um, additional card, if, if you do that, there's something called IDMV, identity and verification. Um, it usually goes all the way back to your bank. The verification varies. Sometimes we have to call a number, sometimes they call you. Sometimes they ask just for CVV, sometimes they ask for an SMS code or something. There are actually multiple ways of doing this. In China, SMS is predominant. Here, phone call and CVV are. 
In Europe, I don't know how it's done. And a year ago or so, Apple Pay was, oh my god, Apple Pay is terrible. Well, they actually hacked the IDMV process. Cryptography was not demolished. People essentially did social engineering, learned your secrets, and when they actually tried to add your stolen card to their Apple devices, they knew how to answer the questions when they called the bank. That was the hack. Uh, one more thing, I'm going to move on to the next one. D pan. Now, we know what a pan is primary account number, 16 digit, 15 digit, however long your number embossed on the plastic has. When you go to your transaction, oh, I don't have my receipt with me. I, I just did it to show you, I forgot. Okay. Um, when you add a card to your mobile device, okay, each card edition gets a unique pan. It is not the same pen on your physical card. Uh, During the edition, you send all relevant data all the way back to your issuer after IDMV. Issuer actually generates a token. Remember token? Mm -hmm. DPAN is a token. Oh. The funny thing is, so that the same numbers can run on 40-year-old rails, D pan is also exactly 16 decimal digits. So it looks like a credit number, including loons check. Okay. D pan is unfortunate to get people to use this thing. Because if you generate, oh, I'm going to generate random, well, nobody would use it because there is no POS terminal to actually understand what it is. They all know what a 16 digit decimal number is. Okay. Protocols included, not just terminals. So, Every time you add a card to your mobile device, you get a different DPAN with a different expression date. Uh, well, depends. It may be the same expression date. And uh, CVV, there is no CVV for a DPAN. So what happens if your DPAN is compromised? Actually, nothing. Because issuers give you the, issue those tokens. You still need to protect it, don't get me wrong. But those DPANs, um, you can't use a DPAN, even with a CVV, even with the expiry number, in a transaction. You have to generate a cryptogram with your two key triple dash. Okay? Without a cryptogram, DPAN is, there is no value in it. Of course, attackers will go after them as well, because that's what they'll do, but there's that, um, there's that uh, roadblock. Okay? Uh, ATC is also per DPAN, the transaction counter. If you add the same card to a different mobile device, you will get a different DPAN. Till they run out of DPANs, but that's where we are today. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, in the regular uh, contactless transactions, PAN is not transmitted to the terminal, only DPAN is. So if, if you use mobile payments, I encourage you to do this. Take that card, physical card, your transaction on the receipt, you'll see the last four digits of your credit card number. Asterisk, asterisk, last four number. If you have different transaction with your mobile device, you'll see a different four digit number. Yes. The one you did on the mobile device, that's the last four of your DPAN. Okay, do the so, UI on these things usually show you the DPAN? The what? Do the UI on these mobile no, devices show you? They don't. They don't. Okay. Um, if you snoop into the NFC, which you can, I believe you will see it in clear text, uh, which is not that hard actually. You can there, are, you can turn any mobile device into a POS terminal. Not that hard. So that's kind of payments. Now this is going into a transition area. I'm gonna pass it to Josh in a few minutes after the break. Uh, actually, oh, we're doing well. Uh, now, alternate payment systems. There's actually many. Uh, some of you probably know, but there's Bitcoin, Zcoin, Dacoin, this coin, lots of them. Uh, Bitcoin happens to be the most <coughs> hyped version. Um, so the, the, it's a currency. Many institutions accept Bitcoins as a form of payment. Um, in the financial world, in the merchant side, it's nothing but a currency. The way it's processed, valued 
store. That's sort of interesting. We'll look more into this. That's where blockchains actually come into play. Now, there is the concept of proof of work. And Josh will go into more detail, but it's essentially about solving a crypto puzzle. You might hear the term miner. That's what the miners solve a puzzle. You know what that puzzle is? How fast can you compute the hash function to find this specific output pattern? The output of your hash has to have so many leading zeros. That's kind of what the puzzle is. So is it really proof of work or is it a demonstration of how lucky you are? It's an interesting definition there. Um, initial claims of anonymity is, of course, false. Bitcoin is not anonymous. It's been shown multiple times. Um, data mining techniques are actually quite powerful. And this is kind of how the Silk Road thing was actually busted. One of them, not, not the only way. Um, it's actually an underground illegal marketplace. If you don't know what it is, I'm just going to give you a little bit of uh, summary there. Found in 2001, started trading illicit drugs and this and that, all sorts of things that you can't really buy on the store. Well, on, in this state, you can buy at least one aspect. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the person called uh, the Red Pirate Roberts, name, some pseudonym or anonym or whatever you want to call it. And when FBI looked at it, all the communications appeared to go through Tor. You know what Tor is? Onion routing? Mm -hmm. Interesting enough, I have code in Tor from my graduate school days. Different thing. And the, as of 2013, two years into its existence, has that many listings on their marketplace. And um, they, they did this arrest. That, that's actually a little bit of a story. If you're interested, I encourage you to go actually read it. It's not very long. Uh, they how actually FBI <laughs> hold of that person. Uh, they actually did, did some trades, and the FBI did it actually. They said, oh, yeah, I actually went to that account. So, on. so there's a little bit of history there. And it's, it's mostly about tracing the money movement recorded on the blockchain. Remember, blockchain, the Bitcoin side, is public. Everything is public recorded. The whole idea is, oh, anyone can go verify. Well, the FBI did verify. Um, so some numbers about the Silk Road. So it was you know, big, a good, good chunk of change over there. Um, now, in, in, in the, mostly as it applies to Bitcoin, but um, I like to make sure that blockchain is not Bitcoin and Bitcoin is not blockchain. Bitcoin happens to use blockchain as its recording mechanism. It also has this uh, consensus algorithm. There are roughly two things in that. There's a third one. I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, it's called language. Uh, scary, but kind of the, the blockchain actually contains all this, all these things. So this is sort of kind of novel because it's a distributed and decentralized network. How Bitcoin actually does the consensus? It's 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 an interesting read. It looks very complicated, but it's not really complicated. I believe Josh will actually go into some of the details. Um, so, there is a language. Actually, I want to switch to the next one. This is actually probably a better example. Um, ever heard the term smart contract? Ethereum is one such contract. Um, so, not Solstice. Um, I forgot the name of the language now. Solicity, Solidity, something like that. Um, it actually looks, this is Solidity, right? Um, you can write a contract. This is a contract. It's a, this contract has a bug in it. <laughs> um, and as you record your transactions on blockchains, you're trading something with Bitcoin. As you record them on a blockchain, you, you can also attach instructions. Think of them as instructions. Okay, some conditional statements and so on and so forth. Forget about if this is Turing complete or not Turing complete. Put that aside for a moment. Uh, so it's an interpretive language. So you have to have an execution environment to do that. So how, what's our track record about 
executing code that we download over the internet on our device. It's not very good. Not, it's actually quite sad. Now we're talking about sort of kind of this is still up in the air. Is it legally binding? What happens if I have a bug? What happens if there is a malicious bug that I don't discover maybe it's somebody's actually initial idea on it? What does that mean? Actually, there are a few real cases of that. DOA, if I remember, they actually forked their chain. Not once, twice. Because of a bug. It's not good. So, what do we do? That, 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 was a, that, was, that was sort of a not quite a malicious thing, or I don't know, how, maybe it was, I don't know. Um, anyway, so th this is actually a sample code um, that was presented at Cornell Tech in May. Uh, essentially, Northern Maryland grad students wrote this code, and what happens if there are um, third, there's a third player? We don't know. You can probably find more bugs if you look at other contracts, uh, but we don't know what the consequences of those things are. They're still up in there. Um, so this is my last slide before we take a break. Um, a few things about this blockchain thing. Since it's the way it's implemented, Bitcoin is entirely public, but not all financial institutions, not all commercial institutions, are willing to put their entire finance ledgers up in the public land. That they, that's not really kosher for a commercial private company. So I would start talking about, oh, we can actually permission those things. Let's put access control list. Let's put some policy language. Or permissionless is what we have today. Anybody can access, anybody can. What about adding? Who can add to the blockchain? In the Bitcoin, uh, any miner can. That's how it's defined intrinsically. Um, what, what if I'm a big bank? Do I want anyone to add to my blockchain? Well, maybe not. So then I have to do some permission into this. Oh, it's easy. I'll go, I'll go encrypt it. It's not really that straightforward. So that is also a little bit of an open issue. There's a lot of discussions around this as well. So I'm going to stop here uh, for the first half of our class. And let's take five. Josh? OK, let's maybe we'll. Clock. You want to resume at eight? Yeah. OK. Promptly at eight. Yes. You want to get out of here. Yes. Promptly at eight, and uh, we'll, we'll get out of here. So Josh is going to present from Redmond look, look now. Yeah. Oh, I should have. Well, Nevada, yeah. Nevada was one that was close, but they were saying that early return, like. Wait a minute, they're calling Colorado Democrat, Hillary? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Nevada's not really a Democrat. Yeah, but they are the issues are Michigan, New Hampshire, and Nevada. Just. Okay, now this is my break time, right? You've been looking at it, I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this oh, is Michigan's really yeah, close. Like, uh, it's okay. No, it's supposed to mean they're big. Yeah, and there's what? The, the word. Maybe 25,000 votes between. In, 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 between Interesting. Wait, where is it? Which state? Michigan. Michigan. If, you know, between this, there's a 50,000 difference, maybe 51,000. 
Oh wait, it just, it's, I it's got Michigan. It'll be Michigan, New Hampshire, and Nevada are the places to watch right now. Okay, I just got an update for Michigan. Now it swung red. Yeah, it's been. So it's Dow been futures red. are down 750 points. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Don't check your four. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, and it's, and it's still it's right. happening. Yeah. Well, okay, so ignore okay. ignore the numbers because we're most of the West Coast. Like, no, which will probably, probably be our blue. So we had to buy out. Yeah, yeah Brexit, they can change their minds. Up. Yeah. Not this one. We're stuck with this shit. Florida. You got three minutes left to turn your ballot. <sighs> Gonna happen. So if Florida, ninety five percent in. Oh, it's 90. Yeah, what? Right. Wow. Yeah. Oh, Iowa is Clinton? <clears throat> you have Iowa is Clinton? I'm, this is, CNN says Iowa Clinton. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. 50 yeah. versus 44 and a half. But only, like, 40% of them were in, so it weighs out. I don't know, but that's, that's a pretty broad margin, though. Yeah. yeah it depends on what parts of the state offers. Was there a battleground state? Iowa? Iowa, I guess. <clears throat> Yeah, so in three minutes we should have uh, California, Washington, yeah, Oregon. That's blue. What's Washington West Coast? They're yeah. Running, that, yeah, they're, 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 they're already <laughs> like, yes. counted as, as wins for uh, yeah. Well, what I was wondering was whether or not, you know, that works for going to hold off on calling the whole election until, you know, the polls post here, because there's that brouhaha about that same thing four years ago, but now it seems close enough everywhere else in the states they might not have the numbers oh they really the, it it's it's looking great it's looking decisive so far the public house <laughs> beth was also falling i saw that beth was banking down like a <laughs> brexit too <laughs> it's happening. I need some of the three. Yeah. I was thinking about reading some of these new ones. I need the new ones. Stronger than what is it? Is that a lot of them? Do you think this is coffee? Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So work. I think it has to do with what okay. it's Matt, I presume this is about right good placement for the mic. If it isn't, let me know. Okay. Oh, a little lower? Okay. There. It's a little okay. lower now. Never quite sure with these things. Okay, it is now 8 o'clock, even though the clock at the back of this room does not say, no, the clock at the back of this room thinks it's about to be 9 o'clock. So I'm going to ignore that, but my watch is accurate. So, right. um, so I don't know, I, I can't quite tell what things are like um, in, in Seattle. Uh, we've got kind of a thin crowd here tonight, and I've been... Um, uh, s sitting in the back so I can see how many of you here are actually looking at results rather than up front. Um, I am personally um, uh, very distracted and emotionally quite drained at the moment. But uh, we, will, we will spend some time talking about uh, blockchains and Bitcoin and get a, get a sense of what's going on here. Distraction might be good. <laughs> okay, and, and next week I will talk about elections from a technical side. I'm not talking about the political side at all. Okay, so 
to talk about blockchains, the first thing we've got to do is talk about um, hash rates. I, I, I presume I'm in frame. I will stay as close to right here as I, I can. Let me know if I step out. Um, so um, hash functions are a concept that is, are, are well known in computer science. They have lots and lots of applications. Hash chains basically, hash functions basically take arbitrarily large inputs and hash them down to small fixed values. They're very good for, for sorting, for um, storing data and data lookup. They have lots and lots of applications. You've probably seen them. You've, you've taken lots of computer science cl classes. In cryptography, we talk about one way hash functions. One way hash functions um, are similar in that they crunch things down. They're different in that they are supposed to not be reversible. An ordinary hash function can have a property like um, I will, it, it will take the last here, um, two bytes or, or one byte of some value, and that is the, the result of the hash. It can be something very simple that's very easily reversible. Um, a one-way hash function is it's in, it should be infeasible to find um, any input which uh, returns a given output. Okay? That's, that's the main requirement here. Um, so um, let's look at particular one-way hash functions. And the gold standard right now in cryptography is, is the hash function <coughs> SHA-256. We've talked about this just a little bit in the past, but SHA-256 is a function that takes any size input you like, one bit up to a gigabit, um, and crunches it down to a 256-bit <coughs> output. Now, um, it also has this one-way property. And I've got to say a little bit more about <coughs> what that is as soon as I stop myself from coughing all over the slides. Um, so there are kind of three definitions of one-wayness in a hash function. One is what you might think intuitively, it's non-invertibility. That you cannot, given a hash function, go you know, output, get an input. So if I give you an output and say, give me an input that produces it, <coughs> you're not going to be able to do it. Second definition, um, which is a slightly stronger definition, is second pre-image resistance. It says, if I give you an input, you can't find another input that has the same output. Okay, if I give you one input, you can find the output. Rod, I see you looking around. Is everything okay there? We're fine. Okay, good. Um, so, is there a second in input? Almost surely, right? You've got a, a, an unbounded input space. And you've got a finite output space. There are probably many, many probably an infinite number of possible inputs that will achieve the same output. But can you find even one other? That's second pre-image resistance says, if I give you an input, you should not be able to find any one of the large number, presumably large number. You, you can construct a, a one-way function that has a certain output only on one input. And there, therefore, there is no other input. But for almost all one-way hash functions and for almost all outputs of any one-way hash function, there are going to be a very large number of inputs that hit that output, okay? So that's the, the second definition. The third definition is collision and tractability, which says you should not be able to find any two inputs that achieve the same output. This is the gold standard. If you have, this is the strongest Definition of one-wayness, if you have two, then you also have one. If you have three, then you have one and two amongst these definitions. Right? There's n there, nobody has ever found a collision. This is true of SHA-256. No one has ever found any two values that collide. In fact, SHA-256 is, is a re replacement for SHA-1, which has only 160-bit input. That's a 160-bit output, sorry. Um, and has some, some other weaknesses, it is considered to be broken. However, even with SHA-1, nobody has ever found any pair of inputs 
that achieve the same output. Okay? So in that sense, it's really un unbroken. And, and if you could do that, then that has very little practical value with just saying, hmm, this hash function may not be as strong as we thought it was. Um, it's really second pre-image resistance and non-invertibility that are valuable properties. Uh, okay? So that's where we are in, in hash functions today. Um, we're very happy with SHA-256. SHA-1, by the way, it's probably close to having a collision found. If we turned all the resources, turned on mining bitcoins to SHA-1 for a day, probably we would have a collision. And even without that, you know, it, it's expected any time now. People are working on it. People are close. They're, they're probably be a collision. Okay. So, so understanding how hard it is to find collisions um, means uh, understanding the birthday paradox. Now, I presume that most people here have heard of, seen the birthday paradox in some form, right? So let me just say you know, very quickly, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but basically, if you've got a space of n items, as soon as you've picked around square root of n times from this space of n items, you will probably start seeing repetitions, okay? Now, this is not um, you know, a set of n integers, and you pick one, and you put it aside, and you pick one, and you put it aside. This is selection with replacement. So I've got n things in an urn. I scramble them up. I pick it out. I record it. I put it back in, pick it out, and record it. After about square root of n, I'll start seeing, oh, I've already picked this one once. And, and it'll start happening more and more often. Okay? Um, why is it that the case? Well, here's, here's the intuition, the very rough argument. Basically, if I pick k independent values, and then I look at all pairs of values that I picked. Then amongst all pairs, there are about k squared, which would be a little bit more precise, k times k minus one over three, but about k squared pairs. Okay. Um, now, if there are n different items, then if I pick a random pair of items, about one in n of those are going to be a pair of the same item. Because you know, there are um, in, you know, you pick the first, there are n possibilities for the second. One in n things is going to be uh, an identical, a matching pair. Okay? So how big does k have to be for k times k minus 1 over 2 um, to reach n? Well, k has to be roughly square root of n. Okay? It's roughly k squared that, that gets up to n. So that, that's the intuition for this. And there are all sorts of applications of the birthday paradox. In terms of SHA-1, which is a 160-bit output, that says if you put in about 2 to, the a, 2 to the 80 inputs, you will probably find a, a collision. A 2 to the 80 is a pretty big number, but it's not unimaginably large. Um, so that, that's part of the weakness. And there are some tricks to reduce that a little bit. With SHA-256, if you put in 2 to the 128 distinct inputs, or just random inputs, you will probably start seeing you know, a collision somewhere around them. Okay? That's, that's the sense. By the way, um, if you're interested in this, an interesting project may be, well, yeah, but there's a lot of storage there too, right? Well, there are some nice tricks to do it with very little storage. So you can do, with about the same amount of effort, with say 2 to the 80th effort on SHA-1, it's easy to see how you write down the 2 to the 80 things, and every time you get a new one, you look and say, have I seen that yet? No. Have I seen this one? No. Have I seen this one? No. And you keep a huge table. You can do it without the huge table, just you know, without adding too much time, with, with adding very little time. OK, interesting. All right, so let's just take a little, little bit of a look inside of SHA-256. Basically, the way SHA-256 works, the way typical hash functions work now, um, is with a compression function. With SHA-256, there's a nice fixed size input to the compression function. Fixed size input, fixed size output, now we're talking. Now we can sort of understand where it's going. It has a 768-bit input, it's 3 times 256, 256-bit output, okay? Roughly what it looks like. You can think of it as 
256 bits and 512 bits of input together produce 256 bits of output. Okay? Now, once we have this compression function, we can compress, we can hash an arbitrary length input by just repeating this, right? So you have a, a big input that may be, you know, here is a 2048-bit input, and what you do is you take the first 512 bits and pair it with some initial value and push this through to the next layer. Can I write on anything here? I doubt I can write on this. Whoa, that was a mistake. Um, let me see if I can write here. Nope, I can't write here if I do that. Okay, um, if I would be more clever about this, I don't really need to write here. Um, if I do, I'll, I'll get help. Uh, but if, you, you can see what's going on here. Um, the first layer, you take the first 512 bits, it gets compressed down to 256 bits. That allows you to take that 256 bits and use it as an input into the next layer of compression and consume the next 512 bits. In this case, you go through four compressions and you get a 256 bit output. That's all pretty clear. Okay, so once we have this, and the, the rest of SHA-256 is the details of the compression function. And once you've got that, a compression function looks a lot like a cipher. We spent a lot of time looking at various ciphers. We spent some time looking at, at the shock construction. Basically, it's just scramble things, make it as ugly as, as, as you want. It doesn't have to be invertible like a cipher, so you just make it really, really ugly and try to make it ugly in an efficient way. Okay. Um, so now we can start talking about hash chains now that we have hash functions. And a hash chain looks a lot like a hash function, right? A hash chain is I've got some value, I hash it, I take the output, I use that as my, my um, seed into the next um, hash function when I hash something else, and then I hash something else, and I hash something else, and I eventually get an output. I've chained these hashes together in a way that really looks an awful lot like the way a hash function itself runs. Well, what might I do with these? For instance, these things I hash might be documents, as one example. And I get my first document, and I hash it, and then you know, I've, I'm happily sitting with my output, and oh, here comes another document. Okay, I take that other document, now I hash that in, now I take the next one, I hash, and I hash them all together, and now I can show that this, each of these documents is in this chain if I just remember the, the final output. The final output is good enough for me to to know everything else is part of it. I can hash together documents. I can hash together votes. Talk about that a little bit. Um, I can hash together transactions, basically. You know, anything is, you know, you're somewhere in the chain, and as long as you remember the end, then you know, you, you've sort of got, there's no way to change history because you can't get a collision. You can't get something else that will come out to the same output. So. History is fixed, effectively, by just remembering the output. Okay, so this hash chain approach is a linear approach. You do things in sequence. If you want to reconstruct, if you want to show that this document over here, which may have been hashed three years ago, is part of the chain, then, oh, no problem. All I have to do is remember everything else that's been in the chain and recompute everything else and finally say, yeah, yeah, okay. We did all that work, now I got to the same output. Yes, this, this really was part of the chain, you're not lying to me. Okay, um, there are ways of doing this more efficiently. Um, there's something called a Merkle tree, which basically says, instead of hashing things linearly, we can hash things into a tree. So basically it says, take every pair of documents, form a hash, take the, the, the hashes, pair them up, form hashes of hashes, hashes of those, etc., into a tree. So now, if I want to show that the third document in this, um, this tree is, is a member of the tree, then one thing I could do is remember everything else in the tree, and then I could rehash everything and construct the root. But I can be a little bit more clever about this. I can instead take the things on the left and say, you know, I don't have to remember those documents. I just have to remember the hash output of the two things on the left. 
and there are four things on the right, well, I don't have to remember all those. All I have to remember is the hash output of all those four things. So effectively, all I need to remember are all of the siblings on my path to the roots. And there are, if the, there are n things in the tree, log n siblings, it will be log n depth. So instead of remembering n things, I only have to remember log n things to show that I am a member of this group. Okay. Can you do better than that? Well, actually, you can do even better. Uh, there's a notion of one-way accumulators. I won't spend a lot of time doing this, but again, uh, the projects, Merkle trees, accumulators. Um, it probably shouldn't be off. Well, may maybe people will be changing their mind. You can still change your minds a little bit or, or whatnot on projects. So it's still okay to talk about projects. Um, the question is, can you do this in constant space, constant storage? And the answer is yes. And what you do, the trick is use a quasi-commutative function. Basically, if you take our old friend, modular exponentiation, and it's got this property that if I um, take y to the x1 to the x2, it's the same as y to the x2 to the x1, right? The, um, the exponent multiplications commutes. You can do those in, in either order. So what does this mean? Well, this means that if I have a bunch of things that I want to hash together, x1 through xm, what I can do is get them one at a time as, as they receive them. I start off with my base y, and whichever one I receive first, I raise my base to that power. And then I've got this thing that's accumulated so far, and I get the next thing, and I raise you know, my, my current accumulated value to the next power, and the next power. And any, any document that comes along, anything that comes along, I just raise things to that power. And um, it turns out, if you think about it, that a proof of membership in this agglomerated value is just take the, the original base to the power of all the other things. I don't have to remember what all the other things are, just all of them got put together. And those things put together, except for my document, my thing, if I take those and raise that to my power, I will get the, the, the output. That's the same as anybody else will get um, if they take out their thing, right? Okay, fairly simple trick. Um, allows you to completely flatten the Merkle tree. Okay, so let's just talk, talk a little bit about the history of hash chains, because we think of them as this is a great new idea of blockchains. It's all really old stuff. This idea of how do you construct a hash function, this idea of a, using a compression function, chaining it together, goes back to 35 years, more than 35 years. The idea of a Merkle tree goes back the same amount of time. The idea of forming hash chains to record things, that's 1981, it's still 35 years. Um, Haber and Stornetta, 10 years after that, started thinking, hey, we could do this. They added a, a couple more small tricks, and they said, we, we will build a, a document time stamping service out of Merkle trees. Um, and they, they have a company company is called Surety Technologies. I don't think it's very active anymore. They were trying to make a go of it for a long time, but what they did was, you, know, you want to, to timestamp the document, you give it to them, and you, you sort of put everything to, they, they take all the documents they receive, and they put them together, they, they chain them up in a hash tree, and they publish the root of the, of the hash tree in the New York Times every Sunday. And if you go back, back issues of the New York Times, you can look at the classified section, and every Sunday there's a, here's the, the this week's hash. Okay, it's there, it works. 25 year old technology. This idea of chaining hashes is not that new. The one way accumulator idea is something I was involved with 20 years ago. Um, um, even 15 years ago, there was a, a, a trick that uh, Rivest and Shamir put together, um, uh, actually a couple tricks, payword and micromint. Um, payword, the idea was, I go to the bank, what I do is I, I take some random value and I hash it maybe a thousand times. And I go to, to my bank and I have my bank sign this and I put a thousand dollars with it and I say, this, this thing is worth a thousand dollars. 
And now I've got this thing called a hash stack, which is a thousand iterations of the hash ending at a certain value that's signed by my bank. And now I go up to somebody and I want to give them a dollar. Okay, I give them the hash one before the end. Oh, I want to give you two dollars. I give you the hash value two before the end. Ten dollars, I roll back to ten before the end. As long as I remember the beginning, it's very easy for me to go forward and get any value. But you can't go backwards. So if I give you a value that's 10 from the end, that's worth $10. 20 from the end is worth $20, etc. Nice little check. Hashtags. Okay. Micromint was another thing that was basically a birthday attack. This was uh, um, if you've got more computing resources than others, if you're like a, a large country, say, what you can do is um, build hashes with a right left output so that you can actually do huge amounts of hashing and start seeing collisions. And the collisions are now worth something. And nobody else has enough computing power to generate collisions, so the collisions become coins in some sense. OK, so um, once we have that, we can start talking about finding special outputs, distinguished outputs of hashes. So with SHA-256, and with any decent one-way hash function, the best way to find an input that achieves a particular target output is just start trying inputs. Just try an exhaustive search. Crunch, 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 crunch. Um, in, in the case of SHA-256, two to the 256 high hashes later, roughly, you'll find something. You don't get a birthday attack if you're targeting one specific value. So it's a, it's a long way. Um, you can do a little bit better than this with child one, but not much. That's the, the kind of break. You, can, you don't have to go quite to two to the 160, but you have to go close. OK, same is true if you're trying to achieve a value with a certain property. I want something that has an even output. Well, I don't construct something that has an even output by, by carefully constructing. I just try a few things until I get an output that's even. I want something that's got an odd output. I do that. I want something that's got a prime. I want something that's got a really large output. Keep on trying random things. Throw darts to the board until something comes up large. I want something small. I do that same thing. There's no better way known than just exhaustively trying random things to see what I get. OK. Another really old thing. Oh, I, that data is wrong. Uh, OK, there will be a correction in the slides. This is 1997. Hash cache, still very old, still almost 20 years old, but not 30 years old. My bad, sorry. Um, hash cache, about 20 years old, use this trick as a way of proving that you've done some work, and that proof might have some value. A good example of what you might do with this is this has been proposed as a spam deterrent. You don't know me. If I want to send you mail, if I'm not on your approved sender list, I have to prove that I've invested something. So I take the message I want to send you, and I say, take your name, your email address, and I work for a while. I put in a minute of CPU or an hour of CPU or whatever you know, amount of value is decided is enough to get past my spam filter. Um, and your spam filter can say, hey, I'm, you know, my time is worth a lot. You have to do an hour worth if I don't know you. And it gets through, through the spam filter. If you do the work, invest enough work, then I will see it. So it makes it OK. If you, you want to send me a message, you know me, or you want to contact me in some way, fine. But if you want to send a million you know, copies of something as spam, you've got to do this a million times. So it's not going to be very efficient. There are other uses of this. From the name, it's obvious that you know, it was used as a cash proposal. But the basic idea is this, this kind of a proof of work by just trying to find a value that's less, that's sufficiently small. And sufficiently small is, is, describes how much work has to be done. OK? Good so far? All right. Question. So now we can start talking about uh, Bitcoin. Josh, question, question here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so please. Is, isn't it true that then the, the, the burden is also on the spam filter in this example? So if uh, there's a thousand messages, wouldn't that just cause nothing to go through because the spam filter would do nothing but burn CPU? Um, each message 
um, part of what you need to, to do in um, sending me a message is show me that you've got a hash that has the contents of the message and my own personal address before I'll accept it. So you have to do the work individually for each recipient. So if you want to send mail to one recipient, you know, it might be a couple minutes of CPU. It's not a big deal. Or maybe even a minute. Maybe it should be less than that. I don't know. But if you, if you have a mailing list of 100 recipients, you're going to have to do some work. Right. And if you want to send out spam to a million people, it's going to be very expensive. The idea is it's going to be so expensive that it's going to be more than the return that you get from the three people who actually respond to your spam. But is it, okay. is it, doesn't it cost the same co computation for the filter the as receiver? Well? Oh, no. No, no, it doesn't. For the receiver, it's nothing, because all you have to do is present some value. So you have to search very hard, or I have to search very hard, to find a value that will hash with all these things to produce something small. And then I send you the value, and you just look and you do one hash of that value, and you say, yep, that did produce something small. Wow, that must have been a lot of work to find that value. I'm glad I could check it with just a single hash, because you probably did trillions of hashes to find it. OK? Clear? You just yes. Yeah. yeah. You make it cheap for the verifier. Yeah, it's very cheap for the verifier. It's very expensive for the sender. Um, yeah. and, and that can be how expensive can be tuned, of course. But it's orders of magnitude more expensive for the sender. The verifier is one hash. And, and a, a SHA-1 or SHA-256 hash you know, takes about a microsecond of CPU. Um, yeah, it's, it's really pretty fast. So you can you know, use that as a basis of doing your, your computations of, OK, so um, if I you know, set the threshold such that you know, only one in the, you know, I, I take one in a million values, maybe you know, something with 10 leading zeros, that, that's about, no, sorry, 20 leading zeros is about one in a million times I'll get a hash value with the first 20 values zero. That takes me about a second of CPU to find. Well, maybe I'll say 30 leading zeros. Now it's you know, up to almost an hour of CPU to find it. So maybe something in between. Um, OK, so that, that gives the sense. So Bitcoin is basically taking these, these old ideas and so far, what I'm going to tell you, there's nothing new. It's just you find, uh, you, you take the previous hash output, the previous coin, and you start hashing that until you find, with, with random values, until you find some random value that produces a small output. And if you do, congratulations, you've got the next coin. You've just extended the block by one. You've now found a value, that a hash that can be added on to the old thing, and the block is now one longer, and you have been awarded some bitcoins. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. You can also hash this with transactions. You can include, together with that most recent bitcoin, um, if, you're try if you're a miner, if you're trying to find the next bitcoin, you can hash um, the previous coin with a whole bunch of transactions like yeah. um, public key number, blah, 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 transfers 0.62 bitcoins to public key, blah, blah, x, blah, blah, whatever. And that can be hashed in together. That becomes part of the blockchain. And suddenly, this account is worth less, and that account is worth more. Um, and the only way to get something into an account in the first place is either with a transaction that puts something into the account or to have actually mined a coin. And then my account gets, gets some value. Um, if I, my incentive for including your transaction might be altruistic, but it might be that the transaction says, and I will pay a, a, a transaction fee. I will offer up to 0 0.001 bitcoins um, for anybody who actually records this transaction. So there, there can be a fee, and therefore 
I don't just get the value of the Bitcoin that I mine, but I pick up some transaction fees by including these things. Okay, so what things do I actually include together with the pass coin? Well, I'll include certainly my name, my public key. I want to claim credit for this. So that's just part of the stuff that gets hashed. Um, any transactions, there can be contracts, there can be more complicated things. I can put the whole kitchen sink in there. Like lots of things if I want, and, and you know, it all becomes part of the blockchain. Okay? Now, is it expensive to put a lot of extra things in? No, actually not. So let's just look quickly at what it is that you're hashing. So here's a hash function. You're trying to find an output that's less than some target value Z. You start off with the most recent um, uh, prior Bitcoin. You take any transactions that you want to put in. You put in your own personal info so that you'll get credit. And then you have some randomness at the end that you keep changing. You know, like I tried R equal one. No, it didn't work. I'll try R equal two. Oh, I'm feeling unlucky here. Maybe I'll try R equal a million in one. You can try, it, it can be random, it can be sequential, it doesn't matter. You're looking for something, some R, together with all the other stuff, that will produce an output which is less than some target value Z. And that target is actually adjusted in the, the Bitcoin process to make it so that somebody will find a new coin about once every 10 minutes. If people will start finding coins too quickly, if that interval goes down, then Z gets automatically reduced to make it harder to find things. If people are not doing well and it's taking 20 or 30 minutes, then uh, Z will start to get increased so that um, uh, you, you'll get to about 10 minutes. Uh, this, I don't remember the exact number. It's about every 200 transactions or so. Z is recalculated. It's done completely automatically. There's no central authority saying, okay, now Z is going to be that. It's just it's, it's an automatic process depending on how long things go. I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the miner needs to know what transactions it's going to include in the coin before it starts to search for the a random variable. Um, is that interesting? Um, not terribly. It, basically, you f you feel like changing a search is a big deal, but it really isn't. Yeah. It's um, random. It's you know it since it's random. If you search for a while and then another transaction pops up by somebody saying, oh, I'd like to offer this, you can add that in and, and start searching again from R equal one with this new transaction included, or continue with R wherever you were with this new transaction. It doesn't really matter. It costs very little. So you know, it's not really restarting in any sense. It's just everyone has a one in some large number chance of hitting, so you're sort of blindly you know, trying things. And adding another transaction partway through doesn't really matter. What if two different actors uh, find the same value that satisfies this condition? That is a great question. And I am that's the, the key to, to Bitcoin. And that's the only innovation. I'm going to get there in about two slides. Can you repeat and the question? I'm please? glad you asked because yeah, I've been sort of trying to hide this under the covers a little bit. But yeah, it's, it's, it's the key thing here. My okay. question, yeah. bring it back to the next slide. I'm surprised Z is not in the uh, list of things to be hashed if it's a changing value and that it's still, it doesn't it need to be validated as part of that hash. Um, I'm actually not sure whether it's in there. It might be in there. Uh, I don't think it needs to because there there is usually a time in there. And it basically, you know, people will look at the times and from the times of um, the previous hashes. It's not my current one, but from the, the time it took to generate the last 200 of or so um, coins, Z is automatically computed. So um, you, know, you could throw it in. It doesn't, doesn't hurt. Um, so just to say a little bit more, oops, I'm going back forward. Um, so miner who successfully extends the blockchain by finding something less than the target. Um, basically immediately broadcast this value, say, hey, I got one, yay me, I got one. Um, and the, the chain is now a little bit longer and I'm credited with, with this reward. Um, and what everybody, other miner is supposed to do is say, oh, okay, somebody else got one. 
So I will stop mining from the past coin. I will now start mining from the new coin that's just been found. That's the way it's supposed to work. Okay. Now, um, I'll answer the question, dispute resolution. What if two people say at almost exactly the same time, I got one, I got one. I, I was first, I was first, I was first, okay. Um, and they're you know, on opposite sides of the planet. And you know, maybe they you know, are really independent. Maybe the, the time that they found them differs by less than the time it would take for light to travel between those two points. So you know, there really is, in some sense, no way that either could have known that the other one had found it. Well, so, um, so you know, what if two miners really do find something? If they're, they're being sincere, now there's, there's insincere possibilities as well, but they're being really sincere and they, they each think they found it first. They found it before they heard anybody else say, I got one, okay? Now, turns out that computer scientists have been working for a very long time on distributed consensus protocols. There are hundreds and hundreds of papers written on how to achieve distributed consensus. My dissertation advisor, and I got, I, my thesis is long ago, worked on this, he was one of the, the key people working on this problem. And this problem was effectively solved around 1990, 89, something like that. A long time ago, 25 years ago, um, something called Byzantine Agreement, where you have a bunch of um, mutually suspicious players, no central authority, and they have to come to some sort of agreement. The scenario of Byzantine Agreement is that um, a bunch of armies are poised, ready to attack the next day, or ready, ready to attack, but they're not, they're not all necessarily ready. They need to agree on whether or not they're going to attack the next day, or if some of them are saying, no, the conditions aren't right, and wait. It's, it's okay for them to wait. It's, it's okay for them to all attack. The only bad thing is some of them are attacking and some of them are not. And the issues are that some of them might be dishonest and be traitors. And some of the messengers might be traitors. And how do you deal with this environment such that at least all the honest ones will come to agreement and will agree on the same thing. Turns out to be possible. There are cumbersome protocols to do that and do other similar things, but we've got lots of great computer science that says how you can reach a distributed agreement. Right. What does Bitcoin do? Bitcoin, the, the one in real innovation of Bitcoin, the one thing that really is new with Bitcoin is how it does dispute resolution. It takes all of those hundreds of papers about how to receive, how to achieve this distributed consensus, and it throws them all out. And it says, I don't care, don't worry about it. Let's not even bother to achieve consensus. Now, how can, what, I don't know whether my transaction is even counted. You know, this coin, this, this one included my transaction, that one didn't. How can you live like that? Bitcoin said, eh, don't worry about it, it's all right. The Bitcoin consensus protocol, no, it's even easier. It basically says the longest chain wins. So what that means is I think this came first, fine, I keep mining off of this coin. You think that coin came first, you mine off of that coin. One, somebody is going to get the next coin and Assuming there isn't another tie, a close tie, somebody's going to win, and whoever wins, well, it's the coin that they built on top of that is part of the chain. So you're sort of building on sand in some sense. You know, your coin, you think it's good, but somebody else might show up with a longer chain because you know you didn't, they were sort of in an isolated place, and I've built up maybe two or three coins, and I. Think it's good, and then somebody shows up with a, a chain of four coins off of the same base. And now, oh, bear ahead, these three coins are worthless. It feels really uncomfortable and icky, but that's what Bitcoin is. That's how it works, that's how, how it does it. And people manage, and there are sort of conventions about, yeah, well, when a transaction is processed, 
you shouldn't really feel that comfortable about it right away. But after maybe four more coins or six more coins, you know, every 10 minutes or so, you get a new coin, then you can start feeling pretty comfortable. Never certain. You're never absolutely certain. So does it mean that the one who has the most powerful resources wins? Um, it potentially can. So now we start talking about, you're great, these are good leading questions. Mining cooperatives, mining pools. Um, there are a lot of benefits to miners not being separate entities, but pooling their resources together and, and, and working together. Why? Well. There are actually two principal benefits. The first is you get sort of a centralized transaction processing. Um, and right, if you remember, let me just rush back to this. Um, um, you don't have to worry about all the different transactions. Basically, you can have a single mining director who just hashes together coin and whatever transactions the pool director says should be included, and you, know, you put in the, um, the pools public key, the pools info, um, and you're mining off of that instead. Um, but you don't have to worry about keeping track of transactions coming from various places. You've got a mining director who has said, okay, I have hashed the previous coin and a whole bunch of transactions, and now, I, and, and the um, identification info, and all you have to do is one more hash. Just add the randomness, try to find something. Okay, that's one of the benefits that I don't have to think very hard. Um, I get the transaction processing done by somebody else. My mining director just says, "Okay, here's your starting point. Try to find a random value off of this point. Okay, here's a new starting point. Try to find a random value off of that." Point. The other thing you get is, as a benefit is amortization, reduced volatility. The problem is there are thousands of people out there who are mining, who have invested a lot of money in hardware. When this first was done, it was just, oh, you have a few spare CPU cycles. I've got a screensaver. Maybe I'll try to mine some Bitcoins. Hey, I found one. Great. Now your chance is basically zero, because there are people with expensive, sophisticated GPU processors burning enough power to light up cities trying to find small hash values. Oh, good. Really useful you know, um, way, way to, to consume energy. But what, what that means is um, if I find the next Bitcoin on my own, it might be worth something like $10,000 because it's actually not just one Bitcoin, it's a bunch of Bitcoins and with a value, figure $10,000. The value goes down over time in ways that if you're interested in what you talk about. But, but basically, finding it, yay, 10K for me, great. Well, I may have invested 10K in hardware, this, and on average, I might get this once every year, once every two years, something like that. That's very high volatility. Maybe I'll get lucky and get two this year. And maybe I'll be unlucky and get nothing this year and nothing next year. And I put ten thousand dollars in hardware, and I've got nothing, and I might not. Get that. Well, what you can do if you're in a mining pool is you share the wealth, okay? Um, and that way, you know, a, a, a medium-sized pool might get a few hits a day, and everybody shares it. And that that way, you know, my hardware is worth it. Um, so let me give you a, just a little bit more details on how to make this work. Um, Pools can pay their members in proportion to their failed contributions. Um, and the, the way this works is actually a very clever trick. We're looking for really tiny hash outputs, hash outputs smaller than Z. Well, the pool can say, you know what? If you get something that's within a million times Z, not really super small, but fairly small, let me know. And I will, as a, hash, as a mining director, I will keep track of all these things. And you'll probably hit a few of them as you go you know, every day. Um, so you'll be close. You're not likely to hit the really small value, but you're going to get some smallish values. And that'll be your, your proof of work 
in mining for the collective. And I will pay out if somebody get, gets a hit on this, this next coin in proportion to all the near misses. So if you contribute a whole bunch of near misses, then you get a good share. If you contribute only one, then you were you know, busy that day. If you were trying to mine on your own, then you were putting, the only way to mine on your own on the side is you put your own info instead of the pool reader info. And that's fine, you're welcome to mine on your own, but your near misses are not gonna be valued as anything in the pool because their near misses on somebody else's ID. No good. So that's how the, the pool pays itself out. It pays out, and it, it seems to work pretty well. But there is this integrity problem. Large enough pools can start cheating. Right? Suppose I've got two thirds of the mining power in a pool. Then you build up a nice, you, you get a coin outside of the pool. What I do is, yeah, that's nice, I'm gonna ignore it. Because even if you build up a, a few coins in the chain, I've got more power, I'm gonna eventually have a longer chain than you. And all your stuff is gonna be worthless. So mining pools can threaten integrity. It turns out you don't even have to have a majority. Uh, it's a little bit trickier, but if you have a large enough minority, larger than a third of the miners, you can start playing games and getting advantages and really kind of screwing the people who are outside of the pool. Why does this happen? There are some pools. The pools have occasionally gone over 50%, and certainly over a third. The reason that this doesn't happen right now is, yes, that could be done, but everybody would know that that's happening, and you would undermine the, the value of the currency itself. So you would get more coins by cheating if you have a really large pool, but the value of those coins would go through the floor, much like the Dow seems to be doing today, or tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, sorry. I so, almost done. So, what do blockchains provide? Distributed consensus without any trusted authority, any random source. If there was a trusted random source, you were counting solar flares and whatnot, that's good enough to, say, to basically say, Forget about all this proof of work. Oh, random value just came up from the, the sun. Oh, you get the coins this time, or you get to be the leader this time. You get the valuable thing. Instead, we're doing all this work to pick who is the next leader, the next one to get a reward, the next whatever. Um, if, if there were a trusted random source, if there were a trusted central authority, we don't need to be burning up the power of medium-sized cities to be able to do this. Um, but blockchains really do have the ability to randomly select a leader, a winner from a group in a completely fair manner, or almost completely fair, reasonably fair manner, let's say, without having to rely on this trusted authority or trusted random source. Okay? So that's what they're good for. It, it does have some value. It is an innovation, it has a value, but it's limited. It's limited to situations like this. It's often overreached, okay? It's not very useful when there's a central authority available. Right? Um, I have seen this proposed for elections many times. I've seen this proposed for many things all over. Elections are one example where it's just a terrible idea because you've already got a central authority. You've got somebody who's set ballots, and who said when the polls open, when the polls close or whatnot. As well, you don't have to trust the central authority. You just have to have a central authority that, that is responsible for doing the stuff. And you can tell whether the central authority is doing it right or not. What blockchains do is give you this without anybody even being in the role of a central authority. Um, the banking system, you don't need blank blockchains for banks. Banks are already there. They are clearing houses, they function, they're good, okay? Um, one thing to note, though, is that a lot of the stuff that I talked about at the beginning of this stuff, hash chains, hash trees, lots of things have really useful applications, are now suddenly being rebranded as blockchains, as sometimes private blockchains, 
what, what Haber and Stornetta did with their surety timestamping thing, today they could remarket this as blockchain timestamping service and probably make a lot of money, even though it's a 25 year old idea. But if you put blockchains in the name, hey, that's new, that's good, that's, that's great. So there's a lot of stuff that's called blockchains that actually is useful, it's just not really new. Um, but the new stuff that's useful is actually very limited, but it's non-zero. Okay? That's a quick sentence. So that is the end. I told you we'd get out pretty quickly. Uh, any questions on blockchains? Yes. So um, what's to stop a government actor um, from deploying 10 million uh, miners to corrupt the system and bring back the currency in PG? Absolutely nothing. So in case you didn't hear it in, in Seattle, you know, I, I hope you hear, but the question is about, you know, Bad actors with a lot of computing power, yes. It's been suggested that bad actors or government actors, if they're good or bad, whatever, could destabilize Bitcoin. Um, and you know, there are many altcoins of various kinds that, that out there that have very little mining. And yeah, people can come along and exert a lot of power and, and have a lot of influence on them. Um, if you've got enough computing power, then you can completely destabilize it. These things have gotten pretty big. And it's now going to take a lot of computing power to push Bitcoin aside. Other altcoins, maybe not so much. But it, yeah, it's certainly possible. Okay. Anything else here? Yeah? Not so much um, on the slides, but is there more, uh, is there just more reading about you know, blockchains or like the interplay with real, between real money and um, Bitcoin? Bitcoin is finite, it seems like it's, it's just like gold and eventually run into the same problem. So there's a, there's a lot of literature on Bitcoin. I can point to some of it. Most of it's not that good, but you know, some of it's okay. Um, yeah, so let, let me just you know, give a little bit more detail on the way Bitcoin itself works. Bitcoin has this funny algorithm that said, that said for the first However many Bitcoins mined, I don't remember, several million, I, I think, something like 10 million um, times that somebody hit a Bitcoin, they get 50 Bitcoins. Now, what is a Bitcoin worth? I don't know, but you get 50 of them. Yay. Um, and then after, um, I think the number is 11 and a half million. Maybe 10, 10. After the first 10 and a half million of them, now, each time you succeed, you suddenly get only 25 million. And for the, the next um, 11 and a half million, uh, 10 and a half million times, I think I've got these numbers, right? Um, you get 25 million and then run out 12.5 Bitcoins now per hit. And that gets cut in half every final period. So the amount of Bitcoin being mined is a finite currency. This is a convergence sequence, um, 23 million Bitcoins, and maybe I've, I've got that back to 50 wrong, but I think it's 23 million um, Bitcoins that are the, the entire sum currency. Now, economists will tell you a finite currency is a terrible thing that causes a death spiral. Um, but that's how Bitcoins are constructed. The theory is that as time goes on, miners will keep on mining not so much for the value of the Bitcoin, the, the new coin that they mine, but for the transaction fees. Maybe that'll work, maybe it'll die a horrible death. I think, if, if I remember correctly, we're, we just hit the third epic of Bitcoin. So we, we just, within the past year, you know, sometime earlier this year, I think it was, that we went down from 25 Bitcoin per hit to 12 and a half. People are still mining. People have invested in all this hardware. They're still going. Will they keep on going when it gets down to six and a quarter? Three and an eighth? Yeah. At some point, there's diminishing returns here. So, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, we, I, I can probably point you to this. I, I don't have anything offhand that I suggest is great reading. Uh, you can just do a web search and you'll find hundreds of books on Bitcoin. And there, there are a few popular ones, but nothing that's really that great. Um, actually, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking about one, I don't remember, I, 
but yeah, I'll, I'll give mine to you later. Uh, okay. Anything in Seattle? Seems quiet. Okay. How, um, oh, okay. How, how is Z? Yep. How, how is Z controlled? Uh, you said that uh, it gets reduced or increased depending on the. Sorry. This, oh, Z. Yes. Yeah, um, the, 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 there is a, a computation that is performed that said that takes how long it takes to how long it took to find the last I don't remember the exact number you know it's it's about two hundred you know one hundred and it's a strange number it's like one hundred sixteen bitcoins or, or something in the something where around two hundred and you take that that total time and you say oh that was you know, this took this much time. Um, now we divide the total time by that to, to compute z in a completely deterministic way. And you know, I can't, off the top of my head right now, give you exactly what the formula is. But I'm sure you could derive one for yourself that will just say, OK, this is how long it took. Now this is what z has to be, assuming the time is the same for the next 100 whatever many things for it to, to take. 10 minutes on average. And it's, it's a straight calculation. It's all deterministic. Nobody has to intervene to try to set what it is. Everybody kind of agrees on it based on the time. And they just move blithely forward. And it's usually not a problem because the chance, you know, if there's minor fluctuations, the chance of your getting a, a, a value that's either just a tiny bit above Z or a tiny bit below Z is so small that it doesn't really seem to be a problem. Uh, but you know, I, I think they've, I, I've never heard of there being a problem of disagreement over Z and therefore disagreement over whether or not something is a new coin. Doesn't seem to come up. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so we can all go home and see if home still exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we, we, we have gotten your proposals, I hope, and we will go over them probably not in the next day or two. We might be cleaning up we rubble. Up in a couple days. Yeah, but in a few days, hopefully, things oh, will so. establish and, and we'll see. Uh, and uh, somebody can talk to you whether things are better or worse than they were when, when I started. Okay, good night, everybody.